Hi, Good guys. evening, everybody. Hi, Jake. Um, apologies, all. We seem to be having some technical difficulties uh, tonight. Um, trying to look on the light-hearted side of things and chatting to Jake about uh, going across to Apple Mac and staying on Windows, etc. But um, just one of those things. So again, apologies, all. Uh, we have um, attendees from all around the world, actually. We have a lot of uh, our US uh, colleagues and we have uh, going as far as India and Dubai and uh, obviously the UK and Europe as well. So welcome to the radiating arm pain and numbness, a complex case of upper limb peripheral neuropathy webinar. Um, my name is Simon Ramshaw. I run the European um, Middle East and African network for US based Aconia. Um, we started with the, the lasers to treat pain and accelerated healing uh, around a year and a half ago. And um, it's really changed the way that we've run our business uh, across the board. Uh, we're lucky enough to meet uh, Dr. Jake Cook um, a few years ago when he worked for another clinic uh, who bought the Accelerate laser um, and met him at uh, the BCA conference. Uh, Jake has started his own clinic now, the Neuromuscular Clinic, which uh, which opened, I think it was about a year or so ago. Jake, wasn't it? A couple of years ago? Yeah, a couple of years ago now. A couple of years ago. And um, yeah, we have struck up a very good relationship with Jake. And um, whether it's Aconia USA or Aconia Europe, we're big believers in, uh, in education as well as uh, research and science. So we want the best speakers on. We've been lucky enough to have some great speakers from over the pond with Dr. Rob Silverman, Dr. Trevor Berry, Dr. Kurt Gare, and we've got our own Dr. Robert Sullivan, who ran a very successful series recently on the scientific underpinning of non-thermal lasers, very much going into the gray areas that still seem to exist um, in low-level laser and photobiomodulation, um, understanding the differences between the likes of true laser diode, LED, infrared, uh, thermal laser, etc. Um, tonight, it's Jake's turn. So, Jake, very much appreciate your time. Um, so, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. I'm so sorry to keep you all waiting. I hate to waste your time like that. Uh, when we started the clinic, everyone told me you have to buy a Mac. They're the most reliable, the best thing ever. And this one has been a nightmare. And so, I had a beautiful presentation. I was setting it all up so you could hopefully see me and hear me on better quality equipment. And the whole thing froze. And that's what we've been doing for the last 15, 20 minutes is just trying to get it going. It seems to be every time I try to change the webcam, the thing freezes. So uh, we're going to go for a slightly less personal version this time. And you can just look at the presentation and listen to my calm, relaxing voice. So today we're going to be talking about uh, an interesting case of radiating arm pain and numbness. Now, it was a bit of a complex case history. So I thought this is a good example, a good reason to go back to the clinical anatomy and the clinical significance of the peripheral nerves and um, we're going to work through the case and show you we're not so interested in the the textbook anatomy but we want to know what actually turns up in your clinic not as surgeons but as chiropractors and physios who are actually sealing this stuff on a day-to-day basis so yes so another fun thing with the mac freezing is i was making this presentation better than 10 minutes before it froze. Unfortunately, all, uh, some changes to the slideshow, so I'm going to have to just adapt it a little bit as we go along. It's a 34-year-old male who presented with left proximal shoulder pain, radiating into his arm, into the ulna aspect of his lower arm and hand. However, he would mainly say that his whole hand was numb. So the pain's going into the ulna aspect of his hand, but he would say the whole hand is numb. He noticed that his shoulder and arm pain was worse when he was at work. He's a desk worker. He's just sitting at a desk all day as an accountant. So it's worse when he was at work. Um, and when he gets stressed or he's working long hours, he found that exercise often uh, provokes his pain. However, he was waking during the night, and that's when he would complain of his numb hand. So during the day, it was mainly about shoulder pain, but at night time, it was all about the numb hand. Denied any neurological signs and symptoms in the lower limb, no changes in bowel or bladder, no red flags or anything to be, able to be concerned about. So let's talk through. Oh, see, look, this slideshow is just terrible. I'm sorry, there's too much words on this. Let's let's just try and be creative. So this is my thought process with every every patient. So my first question I want to ask myself is: 
is it broken? Very simply, can they sense it? Can they move it? The nerve system role, the whole point of having a nervous system is to have a sensory system and a motor system. The sensory system is there to detect changes in your environment, both your internal environment and your external environment, so that you can then react to it by moving. Now, that reacting to your environment by, might be running away from a, a large dog. It might be moving towards a table for the sandwiches. It could also be dilating your pupil when you see a pretty person, uh, increasing your heart rate. It could be just moving your bowels after you've had that huge table of, of sandwiches. So the whole point of the nervous system is to detect change in your environment so you can react to it. The second question I want to ask myself is, is it too much or too little? And that sounds very simplistic, but we basically want to get into the idea of, is it too much sensation or too little sensation? Is it too much movement or too little movement? So in the case of a peripheral nerve entrapment or, or something along those lines, we want to ask yourself, can they feel too much or too little? Is there too much pain or too little pain? Is there too much soft touch uh, or too little? Is the muscle tone too high or is it too low? Is the reflex too strong or is it too weak? So too much or too little sounds like a very silly question, but you want to get into the habit of asking about all kinds of things. Now, for your basic neuromusculoskeletal exam, that's helpful. And as you get more advanced and you start looking at more complex things, maybe some comes in with a movement disorder, you want to ask yourself the same question. What is this movement? Is it dystonia or is it more something more explosive? You know, is it too much or too little? So if it's broken and they come in and I think, yeah, they can't feel it, they can't sense it, they can't move it. For most of us, that's someone who shouldn't be in our office very long, or if they're gonna stay in the office, we need to at least refer back to our GP, um, refer for further tests, and maybe ask for a neurological consultation. By my book, when we're looking at muscles, if it's less than, if it's grade three or less, I would class that as broken and that's someone you want to get um, referred forward. So basically if they can't resist you at all, they can move it against gravity, um, but they can't resist, you can't, you know, they can't match your resistance at all, I would class that as broken. The same for sensation. If they can't feel it or they can't sense it, whether you're, you know, whether they can't see it or they can't feel it, you know, you can't get reaction from the tool, that's broken. If it's severely reduced, I would still class that as broken. If it's mild or moderate, then I would stick with them. Now, normally for my notes, I just use, when I ask patients about sensation, it's very simple. When they say, well, it's a little bit less, I want to just know, is it mild, moderately, or severely reduced? Lately, I've been asking people to be a bit more specific with percentages. So is it 100% normal? Is it 90% less? Uh, is it 90%? Is it 70% of what it normally would be? Um, just so I can gauge what their, what their, uh, current situation is like. So is it broken? For most of us, patients aren't gonna be broken because if they were broken, they should probably be, they probably would have already gone to the GP or A&E and hopefully they would have been taken care of by someone else. So they're probably not broken, but it's still important to make sure that we're not making assumptions. Too much or too little? Is it too much sensation, too little sensation, too much movement or too little movement? And then what's level? So is it a peripheral local injury? Is it a level of spinal cord, brain stem, or cortex? Now, I've kept that fairly simple, but you could divide those levels up further. Whenever you are examining someone, you want to, all of us will get cognitively lazy and we'll start making assumptions. So we want to get into the habit of thinking, if I went up a level, so I think this might be a median nerve entrapment at the wrist. If I went up a level and we went to the elbow, how would that change? What muscles should I test? would I see a change in sensation from what I'm currently seeing? If we went up another level and we went to the nerve roots of the cervical spine, how would that presentation change? Would it look like this, yes or no? The advantage of asking yourself what level is it slows your thinking down, it makes you problem solve better. Now, your hunch is probably right. The majority of the time, you've got years of experience and years of expertise. So the majority of the time, your hunch and your quick thinking is probably right. But it's still very important to make yourself slow down so we don't miss those occasions where you're wrong. So once you have identified too much or too little and what level, 
you probably have an idea of what causes, but it's still important to ask yourself, vindicate. So I have at the top of my to-do list every day, so a the words vindicate. And it's to remind myself to think through, could it be vascular? Could it be infectious, neoplastic, degenerative, atriogenic or intoxication, congenital, compressive, autoimmune, traumatic or endocrine? Now, as chiropractors or physios, the vast majority of patients we're going to see will be degenerative, um, traumatic or compressive. Now, I, I obviously haven't invented Vindicate as a, as a little way to remember it, um, but I did add the compressive onto the end of congenital, so that is worth something. Um, so if you think, oh, that's a bit weird, it's because I stuck it on there to put a lot of, a lot of the um, peripheral injuries that we're going to see, I didn't feel quite, quite covered on there. So Vindicate. So, we've got a patient who has proximal shoulder pain radiating into the arm. So we can be pretty sure that something on this diagram is the cause of it. So what we're gonna to do today is work through some of that differential diagnosis and some rationale. So the brachial plexus, C5 to T1. Now, if we were being academic, we can see that there's um, like five different sections there that you could learn. So you could learn about the nerve roots, you can learn about uh, the trunks, the uh, divisions, cores, and branches. Clinically, for us, the ones we're interested in really are that there are five roots and there are five terminal branches. The five roots are the ones that clinically cause us the most trouble, and the five terminal branches are uh, equally troublesome. Whereas those trunks, divisions, and cords, they all have nerves coming off them that are important parts of anatomy, but they're not that clinically significant for us. So, okay, I was expecting a different slide. Fun times. Let's go back. C5. Would we expect, if this patient had a C5 radiculopathy, would we expect him to have proximal shoulder pain? Yeah, that's reasonable. Would we expect him to say he has pain going into the ulnar aspect of the hand? No, that doesn't fit quite so well. If we think of the myotome for the, for the C5, we're thinking that proximal shoulders, uh, proximal shoulder, you know, your sits, your deltoids, things like that. Um, he's not complaining of any weakness or anything like that. So it's not really gonna hit C, it's not gonna be a C5. Would it be C6? Well, at least now we've got some dermatome going into the, into the thumb and first finger. But again, it's the wrong side of the hand. He's complaining of whole hand numbness, so that doesn't fit. And it's the, it's the radial aspects uh, with C6 rather than the ulnar aspects of the hand. C7, again, we've only hit the middle finger, so we're not quite in the right place. Um, C8, yes, okay, we're finally on the ulnar aspect of the hand, and, t, uh, and T1 doesn't fit at all. So could it be a C8 radiculopathy? Well, realistically, how often does a C8 radiculopathy occur? It's pretty rare. So think horses, not zebras. It's probably unlikely to be a C8 radiculopathy. So with this patient, we can rule out the nerve roots, which means basically we want to go and look at the terminal branches. When we've been in practice for a long time, it gets easy to get uh, to forget some of these basics. So I'm hoping that by going over some of this, instead of seeing a big ter terrifying diagram with nerves everywhere and labels, we can just remember what is the salient parts for us to remember. So we've got five terminal branches there. First one, the musculocutaneous nerve. We can get rid of that one straight away. Really, there's only four terminal branches that we're interested in, and it's the auxiliary nerve, the radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve basically supplies your biceps, flexes the arm, and it supplies sensation to the lateral aspects of the forearm but it runs so deep to the biceps along the anterior aspect of your arm that the only way it's really ever going to get injured is in a stab injury. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see stab wound victims. I've never seen one. Um, I'm sure maybe some of you do work in practice where you work with them, so maybe that's good for you to know, but for the vast majority, it's unlikely to be walking into our clinic. The auxiliary nerve. Now, in my experience of talking to people, very few people know about what the auxiliary nerve does, but it is an important one. 
the auxiliary nerve is C5, C6, and it's going to supply the deltoids and teres minor. So when we have damage to uh, the auxiliary nerve, what we see is weakness of, ad of, uh, uh, of deltoids. So they're going to have trouble moving the arm from 15 to 90 degrees, and they're going to have trouble externally rotating it. It does have a sensory pathway, but it's, it's called a sergeant's patch. It's just a little bit over the inferior um, uh, deltoid. So it's not, yeah, again, patients might have damage there without even noticing. Now, the auxiliary nerve can be damaged normally through um, shoulder dislocation. Now, you might again think we don't, we don't see a lot of shoulder dislocation, but actually, if a patient has hypermobility syndrome or someone has got a hypermobile shoulder that dislocates on a regular basis, it's good to be aware of that. If you wanted to get a little bit geeky and we look at those three cords, you've got one there called the label the posterior cord. And now anatomists are friendly chaps and the reason they named it the posterior cord is because it lies posteriorly. Nerves coming off or branches coming off that posterior cord go to posterior muscles. So all the muscles of the arm that come off that posterior cord are, are extensors whereas the lateral medial are anterior, and they're gonna supply all your flexors. So if you want a little bit geeky, that's a nice little way to remember. So axillary nerve um, is going to teres minor, and radial nerve is gonna do the rest of the arm for extensors. Let's talk about the radial nerve, because realistically, this is one of the ones that is gonna turn up in clinic for us, and it's gonna be, um, one that is generally badly dealt with. So, radial nerve. It's normally getting a supply from C5 to C8, but it can get C1, but it's just not so frequent. So it's coming from the posterior aspect of the uh, posterior cord. It's gonna pass basically under your armpit and then travel down the back of the arm. It's gonna go into that radial groove between the two heads of the triceps. From there, it's going to come round over the lateral, uh, lateral epicondyle of the, uh, of the humerus, where it's going to pass down into, down past um, um, your supinator, um, where it's going to divide into two, and we're going to have a deep branch and a, and a superficial branch. Superficial, every time you hear superficial, generally think it stays superficial, it's going to go to the skin. So the superficial branch is going to give you um, sensation to the back of the hand and the posterior forearm. Um, whereas the deep is going deep into the belly, deep into the belly of the beast. So it's going to give you muscles. So clinically, this is that classic one of you've spent the night in the park, finishing off 12 cans of special brew. You've fallen asleep with your arm over the bench and you wake up in the morning with your Saturday night palsy. Because you've hit the radial nerve right up at the very top, Let's see if the uh, PowerPoint, ah, look, at least, at least one slide is where I expect it. So because we've hit that radial nerve right up at the very top, um, we're going to lose everything. So triceps are supplied. So when we talk about, we're looking at three muscles really that we're interested in. First one is the triceps. So if we have a Saturday night palsy or a crutch palsy for people who've been using crutches for a while, we're going to have weakness of triceps. We're going to have weakness of the supinator. Um, obviously you can't see me I'd love to turn my webcam on but that's when the whole thing crashes so imagine I'm showing you what these muscles do but I'm going to give you the credit and, and, and say you know what they are so really we're interested in triceps so elbow extension supination and uh, wrist and finger extension so if we have a saturnate palsy we're going to lose all three and we're going to have numbness on the posterior aspect of the arm forearm and the uh, radial dorsum of the hand. However, the other way to break it is where the radial nerve is running down the back of the humerus. So because it's pretty much attached to the bone, if you fracture your humerus, that's another common place for it to get uh, pinched or to get damaged. The other option is you break your humerus and the nerve is intact, and then they cast your arm too tightly and compress the radial nerve against the humerus. Um, this time, the old adage is the muscle that traps the nerve is spared by it. Now, it's a nice adage, but not every nerve, peripheral nerve entrapment is due to a muscle. So 
I can't think of a, a smarter way to say it. The, the place that damages the nerve is spared by it. That doesn't really make sense. So the muscle that damages the nerve is spared by it. So if we have an injury at the level of the triceps, the triceps stays strong, but you see weakness below it in the supination, wrist, and finger extension. You'd also have that numbness in the back of the hand. Now, hopefully that'll be an easy differential because the guy comes in with a plastic after we've obviously got a broken arm. So the one that we are, as clinicians are actually interested in for the real nerve is supinate syndrome or posterior interosseous nerve syndrome. So basically what you're gonna see is over the lateral aspects of the elbow, the patient's gonna present with pain and you're gonna see a um, reduced ability to, uh, sorry, supinate will still be intact because the muscle that is trapping the nerve is spared by it. So supination will be normal, but they have a bit of a wrist drop. So because the radial nerve is giving you most of your extensors, you're gonna see a difficulty extending the wrist and the fingers. So the classic case for this would be a carpenter who uses uh, a screwdriver a lot, or any kind of guy who works in um, a trade where they're doing a lot of supination. Maybe a, a tennis player who has been practicing the backhand over and over and over. So you're gonna see pain around the elbow, maybe pain that travels from the elbow into the rest of the forearm. But because the that posterior interosseous nerve is also known as the deep radial nerve, um, it's purely motor or almost exclusively motor. So when we lose motor, we're gonna have that weakness, but sensation will be normal in the back of the hand. Now you could have just a superficial radial nerve damage, but that'll be more trauma to the back of the hand. And that again, diagnosis is easy. Someone smashed me on the, over, the, uh, over the radius and now the back of my hand's gone numb. Let's, so most of the conditions that we are gonna see are gonna be a neuropraxia. So the nerve is actually completely intact, but there's been some kind of injury to it that's been a, a functional block effectively. So a direct trauma is a good one. Uh, a muscle that's compressing the nerve, but the actual um, um, the actual sheath and the actual uh, connective tissue of the nerve is perfectly intact. Again, we want to ask ourselves, is it broken? Um, because that's going to really help us in in recovery. Now, if they can feed it a little bit or they can move a little bit, it's probably not broken. It's probably a, a neuropraxia, and that's something we can work with. Right. Let's look at the median nerve. So the median nerve is probably the one we're most familiar with because of the carpal tunnel syndrome. So the most common peripheral nerve entrapment in the body. And we all know carpal tunnel syndrome hopefully pretty well, or at least we did. We recognize the history for it pretty well, but our examination tends to be a little bit sloppy. So if we go back to our, our um, back to our brachial plexus, you can see the median nerve is, one, is coming off two anterior branches, two anterior cords, sorry. And it's going to mainly be C6 through to T1, but we do have some C5 there. So the median nerve is gonna run down the front uh, of your arm, kind of alongside the, the uh, brachial artery. At the antecubial fossa, it's gonna pass between the two heads of pronate teres. It's gonna travel down your arm where it's gonna give a motor branch called the anterior artery in the book. Let me try that again. Anterior interosseous nerve that's purely motor. And then it's going to come down, go through the carpal tunnel to give, give you sensation uh, and strength to the hand. So if we work our way down, when it's coming past the elbow and it's going through the two heads of the pronate teres, it can get trapped there. So for the median nerve, we have three main entrapment sites, pronate teres, anterior interosseous nerve syndrome, and carpal tunnel syndrome. So again, uh, it medial nerve supplies most of the muscles of the forearm but the way i think you should remember it clinically because there's a whole bunch of muscles you know i can't remember how many there are but there's a lot you know double digit double digits numbers you could um you could remember for the median nerve i would suggest you remember three the ones that are particularly helpful for us are flexor pollicis longus flexor pollicis brevis and digit flexor digitorum profundus. So basically, can you make an okay sign? If you can, then we know that the anterior interosseous nerve is okay, and the lesion must be below that, so going down to the carpal tunnel. And the median nerve is basically gonna give me my thumb. 
So you can look at all these muscles in the forearm and think, God, how do you remember all them? Basically, the way I remember it is median nerve is going to let me have a thumb, ulnar nerve is going to give me a little finger. So if you oppose your thumb and little finger, um, when you test the thumb, that's giving you a median nerve, and when you test the little finger, that's going to give you your ulnar nerve. So when we're looking at um, something like anterosis nerve syndrome, which is again normally going to be traumatic, so you're thinking uh, an athlete, um, a fighter, someone who, you know, again, a trace person might have something fall and hit them. We're going to lose the ability to make a, an OK sign. Or so what you see is as they're going to make a, an OK sign, instead you get two flat, you get a flat finger and a flat thumb. Um, the traditional test would be to put a piece of paper between their thumb and forefinger and see if they could hold, hold an OK sign and pinch against it. And if they can't and the hand goes flat, you know you've got damage to anterior, so in, anterior interosseous nerve. However, because it's purely motor, sensation would be normal. Now, when it comes to sensation, the mistake we all make is we look at the radial three and a half fingers and we say that's all the medial nerve and it's carpal tunnel syndrome. The palmar branch or the superficial branch of the uh, median nerve branches off before we get to the carpal tunnel. So when a patient says they have numb fingers, we really want to look at that and say, is it just the distal aspects of your three and a half fingers? And if it is, and the palm and the thena eminence are spared, then we know the median nerve, is, um, we know the median nerve entrapment is at the carpal tunnel. But if we see that those three and a half the distal aspect of the three and a half fingers is numb and the palm and the thena eminence are numb, then the entrapment must be higher than the carpal tunnel because the sensory branch comes off before that. So in that case, we'd be looking at maybe more like a pronated terror syndrome where we've got, again, someone who's pronating a lot. Again, your carpenter, tennis player, golf player, someone who's really developed some strong pronation in their arm and they're compressing that nerve. Now, if we, if if we had a nerve entrapment all the way up at the pronated teres, we'd have weakness of that pin, of that OK sign, the thumb would, would be weak in all directions, and we'd have numbness in the whole of that radial to, to uh, three and a half fingers and palmar aspect of the hand. Median nerve at the carpal tunnel is by far the most common. The pronated teres syndrome is not that that. Uh, common anterior, um, anterior endosseous nerve is often traumatic but can occur spontaneously. Right, last one for these peripheral nerves. If we look at the ulnar nerve, again it's coming anteriorly, so it's going to be looking at flexors and mainly C8 T1, but it can hit C7 as well. So If we're looking at the position and the anatomy of the brachial plexus, we can see the brachial plexus passes out between the middle uh, and anterior scalings. It's going to pass under the clavicle, between the clavicle and the first rib, and then it's going to pass down underneath the pec minor. Because the lower part of that brachial plexus is anterior, you can imagine that anatomically it's more likely to get pinched underneath pec minor than, say, the posterior cord. In our patient who's complaining of pain going into the ulnar aspect of his hand, when we now start looking at this brachial plexus, this is the first time we have something that we think, okay, that ulnar nerve would be in the right place, or that lower part of that brachial plexus is in the right place. That C8T1 could give him the dermatome. However, it wouldn't result in the numbness of the whole hand so let's talk through the ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve is, going to, is the most medial of the nerves. It's going to pass down um, along the medial aspect of your arm. It's going to pass posterior to the medial epicondyle of the elbow, where it passes through the cubital fossa, cubital tunnel. It's then going to run down the arm and enter the tunnel of Guion, where it's going to supply sensation to the uh, ulnar one and a half fingers. Um, and it's the main supplier of the intrinsic muscles of the hand. So it's giving you a lot of your grip strength, or sorry, not grip strength, it's giving you a lot of your finger control. So with this one, there's really two places that we're particularly interested in, is that cubital tunnel syndrome and tunnel of Guillain syndrome. Cubital tunnel syndrome, um, 
you think that nerve is pretty long and it's going to get stretched over the, over the elbow. So because we live in such a flex culture, you know, we spend a lot of time driving car with our arms flexed. We have, uh, we're on laptops and computers all day with our arms flexed. We're on our phones, we're on our iPads, we're always in the flex posture. So what can happen is that poor nerve is getting pulled and tugged and serrated through the cubital tunnel the whole time. Also the cubital tunnel uh, in some people, particularly those with hypermobility, it can be a little bit lax and that nerve can sublux. Now, if you feel it on yourself and just feel for that tunnel, that little groove between and uh, along the medial aspect of your elbow, when you bend your arm, you might feel something pop out. Now, in, not in all of you, hopefully, but in some of you, that will be the on nerve just subluxing a little bit. And in some people, that is a major problem and causes lots of pain and numbness and nerve damage. Um, and I, I think I have it a little bit. And that's why I hit my funny bone all the time. It drives me absolutely nuts. But guaranteed, if I was to bash my elbow or something, I'll hit that on the nerve. And it's because when my arm's in a flex state, that on the nerve subluxes, it comes out of that tunnel where it's nice and safe and it catches. Uh, I once saw a, a, a young girl about 17 years old and she'd fallen backwards and unfortunately fallen against a brick fireplace. And where the corner of the brick was, she had, a, again, the subluxing on the nerve and she severed the nerve. I mean, that's pretty devastating. We're not talking in your practice. She was broken. Um, so she was out. Um, uh, she, uh, she had surgery, which is amazing. And she recovered really well. But it took it took months and months and months. Um, but she did really well. But that was what's happening with her. She had hypermobility. She had that poor stability of the old nerve. And it popped out. So when we're looking at flexors uh, for the old nerve, there's only really two in the forearm that we're interested in. One is flexor carpi ulnara, so it's basically going to flex your elbow and turn it towards the ulna bone. Uh, yeah, good to know, like in her case, when she severed her nerve at the elbow, that's a good muscle to test. If that's weak, we know the, the nerve entrapment must be pretty high, like up at the cubital tunnel. Um, the other one is flexor digital and profunda. So I mentioned that earlier. If you just curl your fingers, the first two fingers, so your, your, your next finger and your middle finger, are being curled by the median nerve. The fourth finger and your fifth finger are being flexed by your ulnar nerve. So when we're looking at differential diagnosis and we want to know is it median or ulnar, instead of testing C8T1 where you hold onto all four fingers and pull at the same time, like most of us were taught, do two at a time. Do the median nerve, do the ulnar nerve. If you did the median nerve and you found that that was weak, then you know the damage must be at or above the anterior interosseous nerve because that's where the anterior interosseous nerve is going to supply that flexor digital and profundus. So then we start thinking, well, okay, it's probably a pronated terror syndrome. If we found that um, the patient can make an okay sign, flexor digital and profundus was normal, but they have weakness of the rest of the thumb, then we straight away go to carpal tunnel. It's the same for the on nerve. So if we find that flex carpi ulnaris is normal, but they have weakness, um, um, sorry, in fact, that doesn't work so well for that one. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm talking too much. Let's go back to my little finger idea. That's a much better idea. <laughs> so the thumb for the median nerve is gonna let you adduct it, flex it, and abduct it. Basically, little finger, same deal. So. If you can pull your fingers together or form them apart, that is going to give you your, your on nerve. So very simply, the way I'll test it is I just have the patient abduct their fingers as far apart as possible and just have them push against me. And if that little, little uh, finger can't resist me, but I find that the flexus is drawn profundus is normal, then I know that the injury is probably at the tunnel of Guion. I appreciate it, guys. Without being able to see me with a webcam and showing stuff, this guy, stuff can be a little bit hard to, to visualize. So I do apologize. Tunnel Guion, where do you most commonly see that? You're going to see that in people who spend a lot of time at a desk on a computer, and you're going to see it in cyclists, where they've got resting their hand on the on the handlebar. So what they're going to get is numbness into that little finger, um, and they have they have some weakness of the, the little finger as well, but the bigger muscles will be fine. When we look at the brachial plexus itself and we start thinking of things like thoracic outlet syndrome, 
because of the positioning of that lower plexus, that C8T1, the fact it's anterior anteriorly, um, it's anterior anatomically, if the pec minor becomes too tight, that's one place it can get compressed. It can also get compressed between the scalenes if they're too big and strong. You're going to see that in a lot of anxiety patients. So we're going to use those respiratory, those secondary respiratory muscles. So someone who's very anxious will subconsciously show that anxiety through body language. So you can say to them, oh, you need to belly breathe and stuff like that. But as soon as they feel anxious, subconsciously, those shoulders are going to shrug. Even if they consciously think, drop my shoulders, uh, they might feel better while they're consciously thinking about it. But the moment it comes subconscious, up goes the shoulders again. So these are patients where you do want to do belly breathing exercises, but you want to be doing it a lot. We don't want to be saying, do it once a day or twice a day. I say to patients, you want to be doing it at least four times a day or every hour. We really want to reduce the, the uh, hypertrophy and tone of those scaling muscles. Same for pecs. We want to do a lot of um, pec release, pec stretching to try and take as much tension off that brachial plex as possible. Now, when we look at TOS, we've got two different types. We've got neurogenic um, and we've got vascular. So because we have um, some, some arteries around there um, and veins, the majority of the cases we're going to see are going to be neurogenic. Now, for some reason, the medical world is still a bit dismissive of TOS, whereas the kind of physio and chiro world, we say we see it all the time. And I think it comes back down that, to the idea of, is it broken? A lot of the, our, our medical doc, you know, colleagues and doctors are looking at TOS when it's really broken. And in their mind, it's mainly when you've got something like a cervical rib. Well, how often does a cervical rib turn up? And when it does, how often does it really actually damage the thoracic outlet? Well, not very commonly. Something else that more, might cause damage is if we have something like a pancos tumor and it's coming up and hitting the bottom of that brachial plexus, so C8T1. Well, they're pretty rare too, fortunately. So um, when you're writing to a GP and you're saying, hey, I'm treating this person, they've got TOS, you want to put clearly mild neurogenic TOS and then justify why you're saying that um, and you know, not let them dismiss you as stupid. So this is in the wrong place, which is very upsetting, but it's a good slide for you to see, right? So going back to myotomes and dermatomes, um, guys, what I'm going to do is just out of pure embarrassment, at the end of this, I'm going to find out where the proper version of the slideshow is. I'm going to repair this one, and then we'll make the slides available because there's a whole bunch of beautiful information on there, including the key points to remember about what nerve, where it was entrapped, what muscles to test, sensory things. Wait, there's a sensory to the hand. Fantastic, right? So. You can see that median nerve is the blue, ulnar nerve is the green, and radial nerves on the back of the hand is the red. Um, I don't think we need to go through that again, but you can see things are a little bit complicated. So when we had median nerve, that's showing you both the entirety of the median nerve, whereas if we had just the superficial branch, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, um, the deep branch, the car carpal tunnel branch effectively, what you see is that just the distal fingers, the fingertips and the thumb uh, would be numb. The superficial branch that's breaking off before the carpal tunnel is going to do the palm and the thenar eminence. Right. Give me one second because I'm going to find this proper presentation. I'm going to just have to, to, uh, to try and rehash. Um, so if we go back to our patient, he has signs of C81, where we start thinking, okay, maybe like a TOS syndrome, because he's got that proximal shoulder pain. So if it was an ulnar nerve, where we're getting that uh, numbness into the, into the, you know, the green area you can see there, that probably wouldn't explain why he's got proximal shoulder pain. So TOS was the right kind of right thought process with, with him but it wouldn't explain why his whole hand was numb. And the chance of having a brachial plexus injury where you hit the entire hand only with sensation is pretty rare or impossible. If it was happening, then he's broken, right? That's another patient we'd be worried about. Well, we have to be worried about something like brachial neuritis with him. So brachial neuritis can be pretty horrible um, it's going to present a little bit differently. So the pain is going to be much worse. So he's complaining of pain in his proximal shoulder. 
that's worse when he's at work. Um, brachial neuritis, the pain is going to be savage, really, really savage. It's going to be unbearable. And the difference is rather than sensory loss, we're going to see profound weakness. You might see sensory loss in the, in the, in the dermatomes that are uh, hit, but we're going to see profound weakness that comes on rapidly. So if someone comes in and they have signs that you think, well, yeah, it sounds like brachial, uh, brachial plexus, but the nerve supply, the sensory sensation is, is over multiple dermatomes. So you might easily hit C7, C8, and T1. But the main feature is profound pain and profound weakness that comes on rapidly. And your treatment has little or no effect. You know, that is a, a case where you think brachial neuritis. Now, luckily, it's self-limiting and recovery is normally really good, so we don't have to worry too much. But it's important to, to reassure the patient of that. So why was he complaining this whole hand was numb? Peripheral nerves, generally, the sensation goes before motor. So whenever we have a peripheral nerve entrapment, if motor is the, is the main problem, we really want to go back to our idea of, is it broken, too much, too little, what level? So with him, he didn't really have any motor changes. So I was pretty confident it was probably a peripheral nerve entrapment and it was probably a mild one at that. When we looked at it, he had numbness in just those first three and a half fingers, but the palm was spared. So we know it's a carpal tunnel syndrome. And his history was that it's worse at night. So it hits that, that classic, you know, when he's lying still, the swelling builds up. A lot of people, for some reason, sleep with their, their arms and their hands and their, their wrists, their arms charm, their wrists in a flexed posture. And when you flex the wrist, you're cutting down, you're compressing that carpal tunnel, you're compressing the arteries and veins, and you're increasing, increasing edema. And when you increase edema, you compress that nerve more, and we get that, that uh, increased numbness. And that's why people naturally want to hang their arm out of the bed or give it a good shake to try and um, reduce compression, reduce swelling, and, and it will feel better. So with him, treatment was going to basically consist of um, dealing with the TOS with belly breathing exercises, treating um, the SEM, scalenes, and pec minor, and just really trying to stretch them out, doing soft tissue work. Um, he was stiff as hell, as you can imagine. So he you know, just had very poor mobility, very stiff up through the thoracic and cervical spine. So obviously as a chiropractor, we're gonna do some cervical and thoracic mobilization or manipulation. Um, and then I went out peripherally and did soft tissue work, not just over the carpal tunnel, where I'm trying to um, um, deal with the ligament there and really stretch that out. But I want to deal with the whole median nerve and any other entrapment points. So really, I'm looking at the protonated teres, which with him was just like iron, um, just in case we're getting some kind of double crush where the nerve is getting tagged in different places. So research has shown that myofascial release is effective at dealing with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So that was one of the, the thing. So my treatment plan basically involved beating him up, stretching things, mobilizing him, and then at the end using low level laser over the brachial plexus and over the carpal tunnel. Again, the research is pretty, pretty strong to show that low level laser therapy um, reduces not only pain, but it improves strength in the peripheral nerves, which is cool. Now, in this case, he didn't have any, any weakness. Any weakness he had, did have was very minor but I really want to help him recover as fast as possible. So low level laser therapy, um, has been, there's been a whole bunch of research and they pretty much all agree. Yes, it's gonna be, it's, um, well, I, they all agree. There's, there's never a complete agreement in all research, right? But the majority of the good quality research is showing that um, it, they all agree that it reduces pain. And then there's some some disagreement on, in muscle function, but the majority at this point are saying it improves muscle uh, strength as well, which is what we what we want. Now, for most patients who are coming into us with carpal tunnel syndrome, are going to be mild, so we're going to see just sensory loss. So that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. Again, when we come back to this idea, of are they broken? If we're seeing um, you know moderate changes in in strength. That's a case where you want to go and have them uh, go and get a nerve conduction study because it's quick, cheap, and it doesn't hurt them very much. The question patients always ask is, should they go in for surgery? Now, surgery is very safe, it's very quick, and the recovery rate's really good. So there's not a lot of good reason for them not, not to, 
um, but surgery is surgery, right? So uh, if the patient is happy to give it a bit more time and just make some lifestyle changes, something I left off this list is splinting. Splinting is incredibly effective. So uh, one thing that the you know, research, the splints are used as the um, control factor for a lot of this research because they, they've been shown to be so effective. So a splint at night time to keep his wrist in a, in a straight position, stop him flexing it is, is ideal. Um, so yeah, do you go the surgery route or not? Do you go for a corticosteroid injection or not? Um, whatever's best for the patient. The more severe it is, um, the more likely you should go for it. They've shown that with more severe cases of carpal tunnel, that surgery is the better long-term option. Now, in the short term, corticosteroid is also very effective. Um, but like I said, in the long term, if someone goes back to the same work, they go back to playing guitar, they go back to being a carpenter, that surgery and just opening that carpet tunnel up is the better long-term option. It's generally very safe, but there are anatomical variations. Um, and unfortunately, I've seen one or two cases where patients just pure, you know, I don't know what the odds are, they must be fairly small, but a patient had an anatomical variant. Surgeon is used to doing that surgery you know, literally every five minutes, 20 minutes, all day, every day. They go in, snip the um, um, snip the ligament, and unfortunately cut one of the the animal, and they have an extra branch, a little anatomical variant, and, and they end up with permanent nerve damage there. But that is a freak occurrence. So it is something to be aware of. So I would always say to patients when we're recommending, if you do think they should have surgery, take the pressure and the responsibility of your shoulders and just say, go absolutely, it's very safe, it's good to go for. As long as the as long as you're confident in the surgeon's ability and they've done a thorough examination, so make sure that you're not the one who's recommending the surgery so they can't come back to you. Right, there's a whole bunch of references there, guys. I really do apologise for the the show and that you haven't been able to see my beautiful face. I'm going to improve this all and I'm going to send out the proper ones. Um, let's go through some questions and if anyone has any questions, I'll do my best to answer them now. Hi, Jake. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think these situations are always uh, very trying when technology fails, but uh, it's uh, it's part of life. And we uh, and you, I think you did a great job. So mm. thanks very much for that. Um, let me have a look at the questions. What makes this case complex has come in, Jake? So one of the things I've, I've maybe simplified a little bit too much. One thing I removed from this to 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 try and make it a little bit more simple is how vague the patients can be when they're, um, let's see if I can actually do this now. Oh, no, never mind. Um, so one of the infuriating things with peripheral nerve entrapments is that they say things like, um, he had neck pain, he had shoulder pain, he had proximal arm pain, and he was complaining that his whole hand was numb. He also had secondary pain sensitization. So, when you have pain for long enough or for um, if it's severe enough, the bombardment of pain into the spinal cord starts to create secondary changes. So the full case, and I wasn't sure we had time to go into it, but it's a good question. When pain goes on for long enough, it starts to spread down through the dermatomes. So what he had initially was carpal tunnel syndrome. He had C8T1, and then the pain was starting to spread down his back and shoulder. Now, as it goes down to the term terms, you start hitting T1, 2, 3, 4. You start to get that proximal shoulder pain as well. So you had this horrible situation where it looked like it could have been a um, cervical radiculopathy, could have been a TOS, could have been a carpal tunnel syndrome. Now, if that goes on for long enough, you start to see the pain going further and further down the back. So uh, I appreciate for those of you who are, who are maybe... Um, sufficiently versed in peripheral nerves and are, are pretty hot on all your diagnostics. Maybe for you, this was a fairly straightforward case. Um, my experience speaking with many bodies who've been in the practice for a little while is when we look at um, our differential diagnosis and anatomy is we're still very good at nerve roots. But if I asked you to tell me what muscles were, were uh, gonna be affected or what sensation you see in different peripheral nerves, people don't get it. So I hope it was useful. And if it was too simple for, for the advanced ones out there and for you geniuses, then I, I do apologize. No, I think it's a very good explanation of it, Jake. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Rob's still on the line or whether you can answer this one. 
Can you specify what settings you used? Uh, how many joules, time frequencies, wavelengths, which for us across here in Europe, we don't focus too much on the type of, uh, uh, of settings thus far. We usually supply the lasers with, you know, a basic eight or nine settings. Um, we also will provide, if somebody asks to, to treat a specific condition, we will. Um, but Jake's got the uh, EVRL, so he, that's 635 nanometer and 405 nanometer. Um, not sure, did you just use the generic setting and the dermatome setting for this, Jake, or was there any the <coughs> settings that you used? So the way I use it with him is um, the, the, the researchers using it for, um, with various models, they tend to use about 90 seconds exposure. Um, so 90 seconds over the carpal tunnel. And because of the edema is a big part of the damage, um, I had it on lymphatic to try and reduce edema and reduce swelling. So there's one aspect is trying to improve the health of the nerve. Um, but in, in the cases initially, I just want to stop the actual damage to the nerve. So my thought process was start with lymphatic uh, and get, get, this, get the swelling as fast as possible. Now, there are different in the research they have different models doing different things but that was my thought process is, is start with reducing edema um, and then later on um, I think I switched more to like a, um, a nerve root setting stuff like that but no maybe Rob can answer answer that uh, the technical side of that better than I can. Thanks for that Jake I'm um, not quite sure if Rob's, um, Rob's still on if he is obviously uh, Rob, feel free to uh, to put your input forward. Um, if anybody else has any further questions for Jake, uh, please type it into the uh, into the question box on the right hand side, halfway down. Um, so we'll give it a couple more uh, more minutes. What what sort of, what other cases have you been rather than going into depth, Jake? But what other uh, cases have you been treating successfully with it pretty recently? I had a poor kid who um, had a bit of a rough childhood. Uh, uh, basically, well, I think we all argue with our, with our siblings, but this poor kid basically has a, a dysfunctional brother who's super aggressive. So he lives in a super high stress environment the whole time. Uh, and he's a real gentle giant, nice, nice boy, but with high stress of anxiety because his, his sibling is so, um, so chaotic and aggressive. And so one day while he was being bullied by his brother, the guy kicked him in the knee right over the fibula, fibula head. So unfortunately, we have the uh, pronal nerve there. So the poor kid ended up with a, a pronal nerve lesion, uh, full-on foot drop, numbness into the top of the foot. So that's been a, a, a good case to work with the laser because he's already gone through uh, GP, physio, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so the laser has been uh, one of the one of the things he hasn't tried and something we're getting a, a good outcome with. Um, the issue we have with him is because he's lived in such a high state of stress and anxiety for a time, that's again, his, his nervous system is primed to detect pain. Um, and so he's not quite at that kind of complex regional pain syndrome level, but he's pretty close. So his pain sensitization, peripheral and central pain sensitization is so severe that I can't really touch his skin very much. Um, so the laser is a nice application for that because I can, I can help him without touching him. We can use pain pressure thresholds to look at that secondary sensitization. So um, whenever you have a, let's say with him getting kicked in the knee, this peripheral sensitization there, we expect it to be more painful to touch. What we don't expect is to be able to look at other areas of his body and also find reduced pain pressure thresholds. And that's exactly what we have with him. So generally pain pressure thresholds or secondary sensitization sense inferiorly, but obviously there we're pretty low. Um, and we're covering the rest of the foot anyway. So he's one of those interesting cases where actually the pain started spreading up his leg and it's crossed over to the other side. So he's got some pain, mild pain in that right leg and pretty savage pain below the knee uh, on that left side. But the whole of his left leg is very, very sensitive to touch. So I'm hoping that, that uh, we've seen improvements so far, but I'm hoping the laser will continue to help us with that. Great, thanks for that, Jake. Um, when it comes to complex regional pain syndrome, Rob um, Sullivan uh, has some very good case studies on that. I think he presented it to a, 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 um, some sort of pain seminar that we had in the UK back in uh, 2019. So um, if anybody would like any further information on that, we'd be happy to send it. Um, there's a question coming in again. I had one patient with uh, radiculopathy, and when I put the laser on her skin, she immediately felt radiation. 
Um, that, you know, I'm not a clinical person by all accounts, but that would very much surprise me. Um, there's not been one adverse uh, reaction or side effect from the laser. What we tend to find sometimes with some patients, it's very uh, in the subconscious. Um, we've had situations before where uh, patients have actually read online certain things when it comes to the lasers uh, before they go to actually have a treatment. And yeah, it, it sort of affected the subconscious a little bit. Um, don't know whether um, you can add to that, Jake, but you know, from my perspective, that's the first I've heard. The only thing I've ever come across close to that is I have a patient with dystonia. So he's got um, dystonia affecting, affecting his spine. So if it, whenever he's in a balanced posture, so if you were to put him with his feet together, he gets these increasingly chaotic, um, swaying, twisting, rotating movements of his spine. If you put his feet shoulder width apart so he's nice and stable, it gets better again, so it goes. And one thing we found is when we were using, so poor guy, so he basically had uh, lumbar radiculopathy, chronic pain, going for two years, and then over the, over the time, pain changes movement, pain changes proprioception, feedback. And then over, over time, he started to notice these weird twisting, writhing motions. Um, and they got progressively worse and worse to the point where he, he would stop going out of the house because he was very aware that he looked weird. You know, uh, if he was in the supermarket and he had to lean forward and, and get in a bit of a balance posture, his whole back would start twisting, so he stopped leaving the house. And I found that with him, if I put the laser on his low back to try and help with the radiculopathy, even if I turn the sound off and he's face down so he couldn't hear it, it would make him move on the bench. Now, if I turn the laser off, he would stop. And if I turn the laser on, he would start again. And if someone else can explain it to me, that'd be great. But clearly, clearly the energy from the laser was, was uh, activating something. So maybe those nerves uh, were so sensitive and, and maybe um, on a cellular level so reactive that when they're having nerve, they're spontaneously discharging and causing him to twitch. Um, that was the, about... Yeah, that's what made my thought process on it. But no, I've not had someone actively have pain from the treatment uh, using a laser, but that's probably as close as I've got to seeing that kind of weird reaction that you wouldn't really expect. Yeah, thanks for that. I think, you know, when we when you look closely at the wavelengths of the laser, 635 nanometer and 405 nanometer, 635 is very much specific to actually rejuvenating and healing. So um, it was completely you know uh, the opposite to uh, uh, to that so we've had situations before which as i said is either in the subconscious or uh, there's been some other reason behind it but um i don't think um, i think dr rob sullivan must have had problems with his connection as well so he's not actually on he's had his la the lasers in his clinic in county cork since 2013 and he's done various different um, third party studies on you know, diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, pre-diabetes and obese patients and various different pain patient case studies. So um, again, he's put that in by he put that in the presentation so we can probably provide that. Um, question, can class four laser help with a spinal cord lesion? Um, I'll try to go through that first before uh, we get Jake's input, but um, this was covered quite a lot in the scientific underpinning of non-thermal laser that Dr. Rob Sullivan did. Um, because of the gray areas that specifically exist when it comes to understanding the delivery mechanisms of the laser. So the higher you tend to go up in nanometer, when you get to class four, you're delivering more of a thermal effect, some more heat. Um, the lower you go, you start delivering more or optimizing energy delivery, delivering more energy and less heat. So when it comes to the class four, predominantly you're providing this heating effect, um, which some can be painful. I think most are. Um, personally speaking, I wouldn't go near it with a class four. Uh, Rob Sullivan would have been ideal to answer this. Um, I think with the uh, with the visible light, true laser diodes, um, again, you know, um, reducing inflammation, increasing circulation around the area. Um, rejuvenating that area and creating this systemic effect which we would do which would go from the nerve root um, up to the uh, up to the brain uh, with focus also on the area of pain uh, we tend to try and get this sort of uh, systemic effect up and down the body this part this communication channel set up 
um, which works very well hand in hand together, uh, which we're able to sort of change, you know, uh, brain memory, change muscle memory, uh, rejuvenate the cells. Um, but that's as far as my answer would go regarding that, Jake. I don't know. I, I know you with the thesis that you did for uh, your, your degree recently, you looked into various different forms of laser. Uh, um, I know you looked at infrared, thinking that was uh, true laser, uh, but it wasn't. Did you get very far with class four? No, I'm afraid I, I haven't looked into it that much. Okay, well, we've got some some very interesting uh, articles that some of our US doctors um, have wrote up, including Dr. Dan Murphy, specific to the class four lasers. So um, if you'd like to email us, we're quite happy to share that data. Um, I'm sure Jake will agree ever since we first met him. Uh, we are about the education. Um, what we feel it is our duty to deliver this on a on a neutral platform and uh, give the, the doctor or the clinician an opportunity to make a decision what they want to use based on their own needs. Um, and that's what we've tried to do with covering this, uh, in the gray areas that exist. So we've got some pretty good files on that and we're happy to share them with you. So by all means, um, email us and, uh, and and let us know. If there's any more questions, I apologize in the background. I've got my uh, partner and my daughter actually cooking. So uh, apologies for any noise that you hear, but it is getting quite late. Um, Jake, have you got anything further to add? No, thank you very much for bearing with me, guys. I'm so sorry about the, uh, the technical errors. I hate doing things badly. So giving you a an old slideshow to watch and uh, and not being able to show you with hand gestures what I'm pointing to. I promise you I was doing it all. I did put on a great show, but uh, but <laughs> audience of one, sadly. Yeah, no, these, these things happen. Don't worry about it at all. Um, you know, this is one of many webinars that we've been doing, we will continue to do. So Jake, uh, we very much look forward to welcoming you back on uh, another one in the not too distant future. I know with our US colleagues, you're doing a, um, a CE, continued uh, education in the US, CPD in the UK. You're doing one of these uh, lectures. I think it's a two hour lecture in a couple of weeks. So we look forward to, uh, to seeing that and sharing that with everybody. Um, we'll also share with you any um, other webinars that we're going to be doing um, from UK side and as our US uh, um, Delegates will also adhere to that our US team is brilliant at sharing their education as well. And they do uh, regular webinars with a wide range of different um, clinicians, mostly chiropractic, but uh, there are other uh, areas that we deal in as well. So everybody, thank you very much for your time. Uh, again, Jake, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you all again very soon. Thank you.